Recording in progress. So Aaron, were you saying you wanted us to go ahead? Yes, I think we're all here, so let's get started. Thanks, Beth. Do you want me to kick it off? Sure, if you don't mind. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I'm going to bring our agenda up for the evening. What we're going to talk about is we're going to do a little uh, review of what we talked about the previous meetings. Um, we are going to start talking about some of the uh, the fiscal implications and trade-offs of the tools we've been discussing, and then some of the equity uh, implications and trade-offs. And so what we're hoping that will happen here is that we'll we'll be discussing these things, um, that you'll be giving us your input um, about them, uh, and, and we'll be working through some of the, well, what do you think some recommendations are um, out of this together? Because I, I think, uh, will benefit from from this conversation greatly. Um, so that's where I'm hoping we'll go this evening. Um, does that sound okay for everybody? Mm -hmm. All right. So then, where where we've been? Um, we had a meeting last uh, last month to talk through questions and answers, and I, I remember Susan was there, and I think Rachel was there for part of it, and Zach might have been there also and I can't quite remember and I may be missing somebody um but uh that was a, a very informal meeting um in the three meetings previously we went through the the actions that we're talking about here from the HPS and where we're trying to go in uh Steve or Aaron if you have a, a anything you want to add to this I certainly encourage you to is um, a report to the city council about these actions that we're talking about and the availability of existing funding and where that funding is falling short and then uh, adding in uh, issues of, of equity because there's issues of equity sort of twisted all around um, each of these and thinking through how is it that the city is it's implementing these actions out of its HPS um, what does it need to think about in terms of, of money and what does it need to be thinking about more um, broadly in terms of equity and how to, how to build more equity into the implementation of the housing production strategy? Steve, did we, we cap out what you're looking for out of this? Yeah, I think that's a great summary and I'm just happy that we're at this stage where we're introducing the equity into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and um, I'm betting that as um, each of you, your your experiences are going to lead you to have a little different perspective on on some of the equity questions, and so I'm hoping that you'll uh, you'll be thinking about those um, as we uh, go along and have this conversation. Um, we've got one more meeting, the meeting in March, um, and if you feel like the memorandum that we handed you kind of felt like it started in the middle of the story. That is because that memorandum did start in the middle of the story. Um, we it's it's a, a large part of our report. Um, so you'll see the same information um, next month, along with a lot of the other information that you've seen. And then the the really new thing will be where we're talking about recommendations um, and uh, conclusions out of this. So what you haven't seen, you, you've seen them in presentations, but you know our introduction about why this is all important um, and about need for affordable housing. Um, and then all the memos that we work through, those those are all sitting in appendices. So all that um, information will be available to the city council um, and staff uh, and others as they're um, uh, executing all, all of this. So that's what'll be coming in March. Um, we've got an upcoming planning commission meeting that uh, I think we'll talk about at the end and uh, upcoming city council meeting um, that we'll talk about at the end. I know we've got those dates um, in here. So what we're looking for in tonight's discussion is you know, questions about the actions we're talking about here, feedback of the about the financial or equity trade-offs and things we should really be thinking about in our recommendations to the city council um, for, uh, for our discussions with them and uh, our, our final product. Um, and in the end, I believe next uh, 
next meeting will be coming to you and asking you if you have a recommendation or if you'll form a recommendation about the city implementing um, the actions that are are in this uh, this document, or at least the city um, uh, taking to heart um, uh, in their consideration of these actions, thinking about these things. So obviously we haven't we haven't nailed down that that recommendation, but we will. So that is where we are going. Any questions before I go about a little recap? All right. So um, we've discussed actions that generate revenue like CET and urban renewal, actions that we say forego revenue. So the nonprofit income tax exemption, the multi-unit property tax exemption, those are tax exemptions that the city would grant um, in certain cases and would result in no revenue coming in for uh, certain periods of time for those new developments. The SDC exemption is kind of something that will forego revenue and kind of something that requires revenue because you can't really just exempt SDCs. You have to pay for them in some other way. So you have to backfill them. And then actions that require money, um, just out and out, um, down payment assistance and home rehabilitation programs. Um, so as a, a reminder, you know, conceptually what we're trying to get to is uh, when you're developing housing that is uh, that has lower than market rate costs um, um, or doing rehabilitation, that kind of thing, we're looking at filling this funding gap, um, whether it's for um, income restricted affordable housing development um, or in a different way for market rate housing development where you're asking for lower than market rate uh, rents. There's a funding gap there. Um, and in some cases, um, we're looking at uh, opportunities to reduce costs that remove the gap. Um, so in other words, if you're not charging SDCs, that means that the developer has to have less money to pay those SDCs. This is something that um, some of you haven't, you know, perhaps seen. Um, but it's been in the housing capacity analysis and in the housing production strategy. It's the forecast for um, new housing by income category for Tualatin from 2020 to 2040. Um, so the 20 year forecast is what's adopted. Um, we're also looking at the existing um, households because some of what we're talking about here, like in rehabilitation loans um, or grants um, are, uh, uh, are not about new households, they're about existing. And we've broken this down to look at a, a five-year need so we can talk about this a little bit easier. Um, so looking at over the five years, 77 units needed um, in the less than 50% median family income. This is your income restricted housing, generally speaking. 38 and 39 units needed between um, 50 and 120% of median family income. This is your more market rate housing. And then your market rate housing, um, this is your more market rate affordable housing is what I mean to say. Your market rate housing, that's just housing that's going to be built by developers. It's going in um, uh, sort of as we speak. Um, that's not something in the 120 plus um, income range that we're addressing. Um, so as we're modeling some of this, we're looking at well, what if over the five year period, we're looking at development of a hundred new units um, uh, for different multifamily type of things. And you say, it might say, well, we only need 77 units in this next five years. Not quite how things work. If you got a hundred units in this next five years, that would be great. Um, so these are, are illustrative and just to help us um, get an idea of, of where the city needs to be going. Rachel, you are making interesting faces. Um, and I don't know quite, um, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, it's. I feel like this is a little low when I think about what the state housing needs are and also the fact that Tualatin has um, over 50% of its low income residents are paying more than 50% of their income for rent. So that, so that is a fair point. To, um, to me, what that means is there's a, big, much bigger shortage of affordable units than 77, since there's so many rent burdened households right now in Tualatin. 
And so if we assume that the same proportion as existing new units are needed, um, God, I'm not saying those words very well, um, the same proportion um, percentage of households that are currently below 50%, if of the 1,014 new households are also below 50%, this is just new units. So the 1,000, uh, wow, I'm, I'm saying this really badly. The 1,014 units, that's based on Metro's forecast for Tualatin's growth. And I'm gonna make up a number here because I don't have this number. Um, oh, I do have it in, in a moment. No, I don't have it. Um, I don't have this number in my head, but if 40% of Tualatin's households, which 40% is not very far off, um, are uh, have income below 50% of median family income, then 40%, 30% in this case of new households would have income at about that. So we're just, we're just, this is just the increment of growth that we're looking at. This isn't about building necessarily new housing to address existing households unmet needs. Um, that's not quite how Oregon system works. And that's why I'm saying that, that saying 77 in five years gives you a place to begin. Um, but if Tualatin managed to get a 200 built, um, uh, 200 units built at less than 50% of median family income, that would be great. Um, and that would begin to, you know, bite into some of the cost burden that you're seeing. Um, so this is not a, this is not what I would call necessarily a target. We must hit that and we shouldn't go any higher. This is just getting a sense. If we take the 1014 units, divide it by um, four for every five years, these are the numbers that you come out with. I, I mean, I do think that I would concur with Rachel and say that I think it does undershoot it quite a lot. Obviously, it's mm -hmm. based on our last housing capacity analysis, which was done consistent with then state law. Obviously, the state is redoing its calculations on how future housing capacity analyses will be done. And so I think yep. that we can reasonably expect when we re when we redo ours in a few years that we'll have a much higher number. Um, and then, I mean, that's kind of one piece of what you're saying. And then I think the other thing to unpack is just the idea that like, especially for lower income groups, wages are stagnating as rent goes up and more and more people are seeing a share of their rent become cost burdened as we, we call it. And so that is another like thing to address that we don't necessarily have data that we've that we've arrived at through the same kind of analysis. But I think it is, I think those two factors do combine together to indicate that like this is really just a jumping off point, I would I would argue. I fully agree, Steve. And in your next housing capacity analysis, this number of 1014. Um, all things being equal, this would be a larger number because of the way, I mean, if, if the legislation gets passed that's in front of the legislature right now about changing how we do housing needs analysis, if that gets passed, then this would be a larger number um, because it would account for underproduction. And these numbers here um, of the lower income households might be a larger proportion because of the way that works. But I don't want to get hung up too much on how it might be in the future. Um, I, I do agree with Steve and Rachel that, that these are, you know, sort of low numbers. I'm going to go on unless anybody has any questions. So, so this is a reminder of this information. So when we're looking at households with income of less than 50% of median family income, and this is uh, this is 2001 data. So that's households that have income less than $50,000 and they can afford $1,200 a month or less in rent. Um, and we know that um, uh, uh, back when we did the housing capacity analysis in the HPS, that rents were closer on average to $1,600 a month. And that's just on average for all household housing, not counting the higher cost newly built housing. And then as we're talking about households with incomes up to 80% uh, of median family income, we're looking at $77,000.
where they can afford about $1,900 um, at the top of this um, in rent. So these are just reminders of, of the numbers we're, we're looking at. Um, and of course, a lot of newly built housing is affordable somewhere up here in this, this highest income range. And it's become substantially more um, difficult to afford housing um, because the, uh, the interest rates have gone up, making the um, home sales price that a household could afford lower than what we're showing here. Um, because these uh, this was done with um, lower interest rates in mind. So it hasn't become easier to do any of this. So here are um, a repeat of the questions um, uh, that we're, we're looking at through the meeting. Um, we've got a couple of potential recommendations that um, uh, you might want to make to the city council um, in the next meeting. Um, so recommendations range from, and they can be different than this. We're just trying to give you some examples. You know, move forward with implementing the actions in this plan. Use the analysis um, in this plan to inform how to implement the actions, paying attention to the straight off, the trade offs and um, of the actions. Um, and there may be some other recommendations um, that uh, that you all um, come to through our discussions. Um, but we think these two are 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 probably pretty good ones if we're getting this approximately right. Um, so as we're writing up this information here, we will make it clear that that these are these aren't really uh, uh, goals. These are sort of floors. Um, yes, Rachel. I think um, yeah, you don't want to uh, create a scenario where it looks like there's not a need when we know there's a need. Yeah. Um, so I think it'll be really important to include that data, but also include some other data about housing need, such as the number of households in Tualatin that are rent burdened, for example. And and, and, that, um, and that is yeah, the information you haven't seen recently. That's all in chapter one. And that's why right. I say okay. so, yeah, that's great. So I just think we, we want to frame that information along with other information, just so it's more representative of the kind of scenario that we know exists. Yes. I fully agree. Any other comments before I move on? Okay. So getting into the, the fiscal uh, impacts and trade-offs and I want to uh, make it clear with some of these where you have questions I'm going to have uh, uh, Mary and Corinne help to uh, to step in and answer some of these questions that you have because they uh, they did a lot of this analysis. So as we're looking at uh, construction excise tax, what we're trying to figure out is is how much of it might we be re reasonably expected to uh, have available five years after a CET goes into um, effect. Well, we've assumed that the city would pursue a 1% rate for both residential and commercial CET. And based on your historical um, prices and commercial industrial development in the past five years, that would be about $500,000 of revenue. Um, our memo shows that you know if you were looking at something more like a uh, half a percent CET, you'd of course be looking about half of that um, amount of money. So here we're being optimistic and assuming half a million dollars in CET collected over five years um, based on historical development. Um, it may, I mean, if development goes faster, um, it may exceed that amount. If development goes slower, it could um, be lower than that amount. So we don't know what the uh, CET, if the city adopts it, would be. But that's that's our, our estimate. Are there any questions about that? We're trying to figure out how much money we have to start with and how much money we need. Yes, Rachel. This is not really a question. I guess I just want to say that not all money is the same. And sometimes you have to have this local investment in order to successfully get larger chunks of money from the state. So I think like someone could look at that and say, oh, 500,000 over five years, 
you know, that's not going to buy very much in terms of what we know about the cost of a apartment building. But the truth is that it can actually create a scenario in which more money comes um, to to the to the housing. So I just I'm just making sure we're all. Like, so how about we add that? To the, how about we add that to the discussion of what is for any. That, I mean, that's for any locally, any funds that are locally given, whether it's, you know, CET or, you know, any kind of local contribution. Um, that, that's a good point. Let, let's add it to the what does it do um, uh, discussion um, in here, Corinne and Mary. Um, so it, it provides, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's an opportunity to, uh, to leverage other money, essentially. Shows local investment. Investment. Local skin in the game. Other comments or questions? Okay. So urban renewal, which we also like to use the term TIF, tax increment financing. You don't really have to know much about that. Um, the city has uh, has adopted um, a new urban renewal area. The core opportunities reinvestment area, I believe is now what it's being called. It's around downtown. It's the area that we've been talking about. Um, we're assuming that the city will bond within the first five years of the plan so that money will be available within those first five years. Um, and we're assuming around two and a half million dollars available for a lot of uses, not just housing, in the urban renewal area. Um, and so we're hoping that that's a, a reasonable assumption, um, but what actually happens yeah, may be maybe a little different than this. Um, the city council has to, you know, in the urban renewal district, um, they have to make their decisions about this. That two and a half million dollars, not all of it's available for housing. Um, and, you know, some of it may presumably be used for, for any infrastructure um, issues that need to be addressed. Um, or if there's ways to um, uh, mitigate um, potential for flooding, because a lot of this uh, area is in the floodplain, those things would have to be addressed. Any questions about um, urban renewal? Okay. Just, I would say the same point though, that it, it's yep. when you get to the what it does thing, that's the same thing that shows local, investment same yes and i think that that's also in a certain sense an equity um advantage um local investment um i haven't thought that through it just seems to me it is so your nonprofit tax exemption this is where we posit 100 units um if it's in one one multifamily development one one new structure or like two new structures but you know 100 new units um, uh, assuming uh, that uh, other taxing districts come on board and it becomes uh, a more useful tool, um, which isn't, isn't an absolute requirement, but certainly would help. Um, you're looking at a foregone revenue of about $90,000 um, for those units over five years. And that's based on um, uh, recent multifamily developments in uh, Tualatin and Tigard. That's where we came to that. So that's that's not a lot of money, you know, when you look at it, $90,000 divided by five, which um, I can't do in my head um, very quickly. It's somewhere around $20,000 a year. That's that's not a huge loss um, to the city um, in terms of revenues. Um, uh, and a lot of cities don't don't try to replace that revenue necessarily. Um, can I just also, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but I just think it's, but I'm not that sorry, I guess I'm a little sorry. Uh, so I guess what I want to say is how powerful this is, even though it looks, it doesn't look like it's a big amount compared to other things. What it does do is it reduces our operating expenses every year, which means that we can take on more permanent debt because we don't have to, uh, so it has like this kind of multiple, it, it's a, it's a very effective um way for us to um things like th this can make a big difference for for an organization like SEPA in terms of what we can do and how and what we can build so question um 
you said that this was assuming that other, uh, I forget the term you used, districts uh, come on board with to join us. Which ones are we thinking are most likely to, and what would be the impact of them either joining or not on the numbers that we have here? So the impact on the numbers that we have here on the nonprofit tax exemption, um, this number is for city. Um, uh, you need to get 51% of your overall tax uh, rate um, on board. So the city is a, a proportion of that. I think it was maybe 16.5%. Um, if we ended up with, say, the school district on board, um, that takes you over the 51% and all of the taxing districts are then participating. The school district has shown in other communities, um, I think specifically Tigard, that it's willing to participate in this. And in part because the school district gets um, funding that is lost from this, um, they don't forego revenue, they get that funding back through the state. Um, so it leaves them a little bit more dependent on state funding, um, but it doesn't uh, take money right out of their pocket. Um, okay. It becomes a lot more powerful when you have everybody um, exempting the the taxes. Um, and so the point that Rachel made about this being a powerful tool for nonprofits um, is one that we will uh, we will work into the what does it do? And Rachel, I'm really hoping that you'll be willing to talk to the city council about these things also because you tell your story much better than I tell your story. If, if and can, Don is here. Yeah. So Beth, uh, the city council has passed a nonprofit tax exemption that is on our books. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so in my understanding is most of the uh, entities around us, uh, Tiger Twelton Schools, I think Washington County, uh, many of the districts around us. Have, not, have also Sherwood. Not, city, not Sherwood School District. They have uh, turned us down. Did they? I hadn't heard whether what happened with that yet, but. I mean, yeah, that's a long story, but that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it but it is passed. We do have the the application on online. They're due by the beginning of March, uh, so then we could take it to the city council in March uh, for to get it to the county by April first for this next year. So Don, you guys are ahead of us here, but we've included it anyway. <laughs> okay, it it was passed uh, last summer, I believe it was. Let's make sure that we document that. I I knew that, but I wasn't thinking about that. Sorry. So. Real quickly, Don, were you saying that the school district for uh, was also sort of on board or just Tiger Tualatin is, but as Rachel mentioned, Sherwood is not. So that, for example, SEPA being in Sherwood School District, uh, that's that's an issue there. Uh, but anything that would happen on the Tiger Tualatin side, uh, my understanding is they they are supportive. Great. So there might be a part of your. Uh of your community that is in the Sherwood School District where this wouldn't fully apply? Uh, would, we'd need to have other taxing entities to help make up that 51%. And unfortunately, I'm at home and I don't have those percentages in front of me, um, but- Oh, I happen to have them right here. Um, so the county is about 17%, the fire district at 12%, TCC, Metro. Um, so it, it starts to go down to get up to the, to 50%, um, you'd almost certainly need the county and the uh, fire district um, on board. I, I can't do the math that quickly. <laughs> in, so. in my understanding is they are both on board. I, again, I'd have to look that up. Okay. So we will footnote that point. And Zach, um, I think that you asked what the total value of the exemption would be if they hit that 51% mark, and it would be around over five years for those 100 units. It would be about uh, 500. Hundred thousand, so it would make it would be a huge change. So that's very that's similar to the number we had on the previous slide for the um, the, the tax exemption, the CET. Oh yeah, but Zach, they don't line up like that. Let's 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 do the math on this a little bit later. Oh, um, because it's only ninety thousand of city money. City money. Gotcha. And so MUFTI, MUFTI is similar to nonprofit tax exemption, except it applies for housing that's um, uh, affordable between 60% and it could be up to 120%. But I think we're making a, a, a recommendation that um, uh, it be uh, available um, at the 80% of MFI level. Um, 
And so this is one where if you don't have your overlapping taxing districts on board with it, then at that point, um, this becomes a much less effective tool. Um, Mary, I'll ask you in a moment or two to tell us how much um, uh, tax would be foregone um, for the for the whole, you know, if everybody was on board. Um, but we're talking about 144,000 over five years um, for the city, um, uh, looking at you know a five a hundred unit building or two buildings or 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 whatnot. Um, one hundred and forty four thousand dollars over five years probably um, is not sufficient. It's it's almost certainly not sufficient to be a big enough incentive um, that uh, uh, to uh, to get a developer to lower rents in the way that the city might be asking. And how would the city be asking for lower rents? This is all you know to be decided. Um, here we've assumed. Um, that uh, rents would be discounted to 80% of MF, uh, MFI for those whole 100 units. There's a lot of different ways that this could work. <laughs> Mary, how much would the whole uh, uh, amount be if everybody was on board? About uh, 850000 So 850000 over uh over five years. So that's 1.6 million if it was granted for uh, uh, the whole 10 years that it could be granted for. Um, and so that becomes potentially a large enough uh, incentive for those 10 years that the uh, tax incentive, the tax break would be good for um, to get the developer to do what you want them to do, which is lower rents. Um, uh, if it's just the city's um, uh, just the city's contribution, it's probably not big enough. Um, it's a little different than than the nonprofit tax exemption in in that way, because you're trying to get the developer to to do more. Um, obviously, you want your nonprofits to build in your community, and that that's getting them to build in your community. So. Um, so this one, I think, is a little bit of a uh, requires um, a little more concerted effort on getting implemented, um, but certainly um, uh, is a, uh, a a good tax incentive to be looking at. And one thing to remember is that CET requires that some of the money be spent on uh, on uh, developer incentives, of which, and this is market rate developer incentives of which MUPTI is one example. Are there any questions about MUPTI? Okay. And so then the last thing like this that we're looking at is system development charge exemptions. If you remember, um, we're just looking at the city's SDCs, parks and water, um, looking at hundred units again. Um, and we're looking at uh, uh, an estimated cost um, if for those 100 units, um, uh, the SDCs for both parks and water were exempted, it'd be about 751,000 um, uh, for the 100 units over five years. And that's money that the city would have to backfill, it would have no choice. Um, and so one of the really pretty typical sources for this um, is in fact, uh, 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 CET. Um, I believe you can use um, urban renewal also to backfill um, SDCs, if I'm remembering that correctly, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, so, uh, and we'll put all the numbers together in just a few minutes. And then down payment assistance and home rehabilitation. Um, we know that home ownership um, opportunities are important for the uh, the council, um, and here are two versions of them. Um, and and there's you know different permutations um, to this, um, but we've looked at what if we're looking at um, supporting ten homes per year over the five year period. So that's two two homes households a year. Um, and uh, you know, what if you're going between down payment assistance of twenty five thousand per household to one hundred and ten thousand per household? Because down payment assistance can often be a big, big ticket item, 
And of course, the city could look at smaller down payment assistance. At a certain point, it becomes less effective. Um, you're looking at between 250,000 and 110,000 um, in, in cost. The city could do something different that's that's not on here, um, like uh, purchasing land um, uh, and conveying that land to a, a, a developer of affordable homeownership units where the units are going to remain affordable over the very long term. So like a community land trust, for instance, um, that's another thing that we don't have on here. That's that's another option. Um, and then home rehabilitation programs, those really vary um, and how much they cost um, varies quite a bit as well. Um, so, uh, so we've gotten our memo, um, uh, home repairs, sometimes, you know, 10,000 to 50,000 per household, weatherization, um, 10,000 to 25,000, accessibility improvements up to 10,000. Um, so if all you supported was accessibility improvements, what you'd be supporting there was uh, helping people with uh, disabilities stay in their homes. So accessibility improvements are things like ramps or widening doorways and, and probably many other things. Um, if you were looking at home repairs, uh, well, weatherization, what you're doing there, a lot of the time um, is, uh, uh, is, is helping lower energy bills, that kind of thing. Um, it can also do um, fixes to the house that make it easier for people to stay in their homes. Um, and then home repairs is often things like repairing roofs, replacing roofs, um, repairing foundations, those kind of things. Um, where uh, a household, um, a low-income household, may have to sell their home, leave their home, um, if they can't afford those critical home repairs. Um, so here, estimated cost between seven hundred fifty thousand and uh, to five hundred thousand, um, depending. Uh, we should flip that around so you've got the low number first and the high number second, depending on the the type of subsidy that's granted. Um, So does everybody understand those two, th those those things? And we're, we're gonna put it together next. So here we've got a summary of, of all of this, where we're talking over the five year period. That's what we're really focused on. 75,000, ah, this is just a, a typo. So this should be 75,000 to half a million, sorry. Um, so these are the numbers we're talking about. And what we can see is, you know, considering your use of uh, CET, the city could use um, CET to backfill foregone revenue. I don't really suggest from the nonprofit tax exemption, um, but certainly from MUPD and SDCs, those are, are, are pretty good uses of it. And those, those fit into the, you have to use half your um, residential CET for developer incentives. 35% of your residential CET is flexible for affordable housing programs. Is it important to backfill this nonprofit tax exemption or do you wanna use it in some other way to, um, uh, to support um, development of income restricted housing? Um, that's obviously, that's, that's a city council choice. Um, you can also use CET for the home ownership programs that we talked about but your amount of CET is going to be smaller than your, your amount of all of uh, all of these different needs. Um, urban renewal, it has to be used within the boundaries of the urban renewal area. It could be used for SDC or rehabilitation of multifamily housing. Sometimes it can be used for uh, uh, down payment or home rehabilitation assistance, um, but that's often limited in scope and it depends on on what your your um, urban renewal plan allows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so putting this together, looking at all of these actions, they're they're one point three to two point five million. Um, we know the SDC exemptions, nonprofit and MUPTI together are almost a million, and obviously that's nearly twice as much as you'd get out of CET. So you can't do all of that out of CET. And the home ownership um, uh, and down payment, obviously they're they're pretty big also. CET can't pro provide all of them. 
Um, and you can't, uh, th there's not a lot of existing homes, I don't think, um, in your urban renewal district. Um, Stephen and Aaron, am I correct about that? So you wouldn't necessarily have a lot of uh, opportunities for home ownership programs in your urban renewal district. I believe so, that's correct. Not not a lot of this. So some, but uh, and you know maybe maybe if urban renewals used partially for um, rehabilitation of uh, um, of existing. Uh, uh, um, multifamily housing um, uh, or um, multifamily housing where the tax exemptions are are going away or, you know, in some way put in to purchase existing multifamily housing um, with some other entity doing the major part of the purchasing, I would imagine, um, and retaining that as lower income housing, you know, those those are interesting ways to look at using CET, uh, uh, at using urban renewal. So, what we're saying here is the city is going to have to prioritize some of these. And uh, um, I, I'm, I'm not, Steve, how much, how much, um, uh, Steve and Don, I guess, is, is the question. How much of a recommendation are you looking for from this group here to the city council about exactly what you do? like with CET, for instance? Um, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, as far as whether or not the city should adopt one, is that, I guess, your question? Well, I'm hoping that we get a, a recommendation, yes, to adopt one, but how it's how it's spent. Um, in other words, if I was going to say, if I was queen and I, I got to say how the city used its CET, um, I would say that, you know, it should look at um, SDC and uh, e exemptions, certainly, um, and look at also um, potentially backfilling some of the MUPTI tax exemption. Um, I mean, those I seem think, like particular. I, I think, yes, a recommendation would, would be appropriate. I think my opinion would be that particularly Rachel's experience with kind of, I think, reiterating what the comments that she made before just about where and how in the process specifically that aids with the establishment of new affordable housing units is really, I think, important to make the connection of like the why, as opposed to just like, we think this is a good idea. And yeah, it, no, that's that's a good point. Um, that's a good point. So Rachel, I think- Do you have that, any input? And I think if there's a best practice behind that, we can identify that appropriately and say that the group agreed with that identified best practice. But I think having some sort of nexus of where we came up with the recommendation is very helpful. So are, is the city limited to investments that can be funded through new resources here? Like, or... I mean, I get that we want to say, here's how you could spend this money, but there's other choices that are made with other, with funds all the time in terms of community development and stuff. So this isn't, the universe of available resources isn't just what is coming up through CET and um, urban renewal, correct? That is correct, but that's the likely universe of, uh of choices. So what we have um, here in the memo is some discussion of additional um, uh, potential revenue sources. Um, and so Rachel, I, I think one, you're absolutely correct um, that that other resources will be available. Um, so uh, uh, it last I heard, it sounded like the uh, the region was looking at another Metro bond for housing. Um, Tualatin could look at its own geo bond if it chose to, um, or a local option levy. Um, some of these things are 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 particularly difficult, um, uh, uh, like using lodging tax revenue. I'm not sure that that Tualatin has a huge amount of lodging tax revenue. It's um, it's not quite mm -hmm. uh, that kind of community. Um, 
but those are are restricted. The majority um, is is for use for tourism, especially if you raised your lodging tax. Um, things like a, a new business license or a food and beverage tax, those um, those are 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 difficult in their own way. Um, right now, a, a real estate uh, transfer tax it's not legal in Oregon. Um, I think uh, do we have on here yet? Yeah, general fund. You could use the general fund, but it's often pretty committed. Um, so there will be discussion of, you know, looking for other other sources of funding. But there are a lot of them difficult choices. And it's not clear that there's a lot of funds. Uh, th there's no there's no pot of gold. I know it won't surprise you to hear that. Um, but yes, um, I think some of the more promising sources are are going to be some of the state funding that uh, will be coming out and uh, the uh, OHA funding around um, the healthy uh, uh, the uh, healthy homes program, um, and that may be a particularly good place uh, way to fund the uh, rehabilitation piece. So I think Rachel, your recommendation there is. Yeah, do these things, but look for other money too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like ARPA funds right now are still a thing, or I mean, there's other, there's frequently other resources. I think personally, I think all of these different strategies achieve different things. So, you know, the down payment assistance, homeownership is a really important issue, especially when you think about equity and who's historically been. Um, unable to become a homeowner, which has been the primary way most people who are middle class have saved money um, and created wealth for their, their families over generations. So that's like an equity approach. Um, and of course, being able to use money to leverage to get additional resources is really important. And of course, making sure that the operating costs for the housing is reduced to make it so that the housing can serve a lower income is important, all these things. And I have to say the down, the home ownership assistance is really critical sometimes for seniors to keep them housed. You know, you know if you want to make sure that your senior population doesn't become homeless um, and they're living in housing that they own, which may be the case, but they have some costly repairs. Like that is such a, that can be the difference between staying housed and losing your housing. All of it's so important. I don't know what to say about priority. Zach and Susan, do you have any other comments or questions out of this? We're still thinking through this. Yeah, I'm still Attention. observing. Thank you. I'm almost getting it. Same here. <laughs> you were talking earlier about how we I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing the math right in my head about what, which of these are actually adding a full amount to to the pot of what we can spend and which which can go to each. Thank you for bringing that back up. So as I'm looking at these, I'm kind of trying to juggle that in my head so I'll make sure I don't mix it up again like I did with uh, looking at no, the, this... the other two. Ah, ah. The CET, um, this maps most directly to MUPTI and to the the uh, SDC exemptions, um, and then you know it it can be used for the uh, for the um, home ownership pieces, um, also, um, but only a portion of it can be used because there's some restrictions on on how CET is used. Um, so doing something like MUPTI, something like SDCs um, is, is going to be required um, uh, because you have to spend half of your residential amount of uh, CET on developer incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a lot more flexibility on, on your rest of your CET, <laughs> whether it's from, uh, whether it's from uh, residential development or from commercial and industrial development where you have even more flexibility. 
And of course, these aren't the only things that the city might want to do to support housing. There's lots of other things that the city might want to do um, uh, in, that, that cost money. There's lots of other, other things that the city might want to do that doesn't have higher costs. Those are, are all in the housing production strategy. So we're just looking at a little, little piece of them. And then the challenge with the urban renewal is you have to spend the money in the district. Um, uh, and um, Can you remind uh, us where the boundaries of that district are? If I'm remembering correctly, it mostly follows right along I-5, yeah? Do, 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 do. Did we put a map of this district or do I need to open up the last? Uh, I think I need to open up the last um, presentation, which is fine. Just have I remember to you saying it. you didn't think there was a great deal in the district. And I do seem to remember that it maps pretty closely along the, the commercial. There's uh, not a great deal of uh, existing ownership housing in the okay. district. Um, I think this was probably in, in meeting number two. Our memo for the urban renewal action has a map too that has the zoning designations within the boundaries of the final plan. There we go. Well, this is the one I could get to really quickly. Um, unless uh, unless this changed, and I, I don't think that it changed. I'll open up that, that memo also. Zach, is this helping you? Yes, that actually extends further out than I thought it did. Thank you. So what we're saying is, I mean, obviously there's a lot of development here, but there's not a lot of ownership mm -hmm. housing here. Um, and the other thing, we'll talk about equity in a few moments, but the other thing you don't necessarily um, want to do is you don't want to concentrate all your new income restricted affordable housing in your your uh, your existing urban renewal district. You want it dispersed throughout the city as well. Um, so you don't want to con uh, have uh, create a concentration essentially of lower income households. You want your lower income households dispersed throughout your community. So um, let me see. Uh, here is the zoning map that Mary was talking about. So a lot of this is uh, in commercial, a little bit industrial, little bits that are zoned for housing. I'm gonna take this off the screen. Were there other questions or did that get to you what you were asking, Zach? Yeah, that was pretty much exactly what I was asking there. Thank you. Shall I go on and we can come back to discussion or does anybody have any more discussion and comment right now? All right, I'm gonna go on. And uh, we'll talk about uh, equity. So uh, looking at the construction excise tax. So some benefits for equity are that it allows flexibility in deciding how to use the revenues. Um, it can choose uh, the programs that have specific equitable outcomes. Not listed here, which we should get listed here, is uh, that it, for, uh, it funds affordable housing, um, you know, at at a sort of a wide range of uh, income levels. And I, I knew as we were going through this discussion that there were various things that we didn't have on here that would pop into my brain. Um, challenges, state statutes, you know, you know, limit what can be done with the CET in terms of, you know, having to use um, a certain amount of it on uh, for developer incentives. Um, and CET, it increases the housing costs for some households. Um, to lower housing costs for more affordable households. So, you know, let's let's acknowledge the fact that if you've got a 1% CET, then the person who is buying a new home is paying, um, presumably that whole 1% is passed on to them. Um, they're paying um, a higher price for their new home. Um, so that is, uh, that is some amount of inequitability. 
but the trade-off is getting more lower cost household housing. Are there other equity trade-offs that, that people are thinking about? Okay. So let's head over to urban renewal. So uh, it can provide funding for your extremely low and very low income households, as well as your low and moderate households. I would also say it can uh, build infrastructure that's a barrier to development of that housing. And that's that's not a small thing. So we'll get that listed um, in here as well. Um, but your geography can be a challenge. So, you know, creating a concentration of affordable housing in one part of the city um, and creating concentrations of poverty. You don't want to do that. Um, and that is why having a CET along with your urban renewal um, is pretty powerful because it allows you to, to focus the CET on parts of the uh, city that aren't in your urban renewal districts. And it's got a potential to displace your existing residents in your urban renewal area. We know that isn't a big risk in um, Tualatin because there's not a lot of people existing in that urban renewal area, but certainly we've seen that happen in uh, in other communities. Um, so that's something to be careful of. Are we missing anything here? And we can pop back to these. Uh, Rachel. I think the thing about urban renewal, which maybe not be as big an issue here, because as you said, there aren't that many, there aren't as many folks living there right now, but just like who's driving the decisions about development? Is it the community that's being impacted? Is it city council? Is it a redevelopment organization? Who's in charge of what the redevelopment looks like? Um, I think that's really important, as especially as we understand that sometimes when you have an urban renewal area, some people's benefit increases and other people lose the ability to, to be there because of changes in the community. So I think that's another challenge. Um, and so Steve, I assume it's your urban renewal um, agency. Is that also the city council? It is, yes. Okay. So paying attention to that dynamic um, as a potential challenge and a challenge to avoid. And I guess, Rachel, just to clarify your comment, you're talking about like residential gentrification or also a business? I think it can impact both. I mean, like my, my understanding is both, you know, sometimes you can take urban renewal funds and invest in local businesses that are there right there so that they can also stay. And, and if there's new, you know, new, a new standard of what kind of businesses you want um, or need, if, you know, they can, folks can get assistance. I think that's also important, businesses in residential. I mean, this isn't about business, but I think there's no reason we can't mention that here. Yeah, I definitely think it's worth mentioning. I will share that one of the plan priorities from the urban renewal plan was to prioritize existing businesses. And so I think that it's definitely in line with the policy framework of particularly the core area urban renewal plan. And so I think that's a great, great comment that we'll want to make sure makes it through to the final report and presentation. Um, can I add one thing? Am I on? Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't yep. know my mic was on. Um, since you brought up business, um, and I wear that hat too, uh, part of what we see on the business side, uh, if we're going to talk about equity in housing, is that uh, it's necessary because um, for the number of employees that, that commute into Tualatin every day to work at all of our businesses and out in the industrial area, uh, the challenge is they can't afford to live here. Uh, so where is that housing equity? So um, I think business does play a part in this, in the equity and in, in this uh, conversation uh, about, we have to keep those employees because they, if they can't, if tolling goes in and they can't, they won't get here because of tolling, but they can't afford to buy a house or an apartment and live here, then our business community suffers, which means we all suffer. And Susan, I think that's an overarching equity benefit um, question of all of these pieces. And I, th I think mm -hmm. it's a very good, a very good point. Um, so I think adding that in um, and considering um, over, you know, looking across the HPS, 
the equity benefits and challenges um, as they relate to these. I'm not going to. Oh, I'm not going to open up the whole HPS, but but um, these tools that we've got here. Mm -hmm. so. it's anything, anything else? Oh, it is. And tolling will become interesting in our, our uh, region. So. Huh. Uh, we're looking at it really carefully at, at um, in at our chamber as our other communities, because uh, that, that is another overarching that um, you're only thinking about what you have to pay in your car, but it will affect businesses all over the area, which then it filters down and affects our residents. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're all going to we're all going to um, um, reap the whatever the lack of benefits are for this. Um. Yep. That's another conversation. That is. All right. I'm going to go ahead unless somebody else has another comment. And what I will comment on is as these things start to th sink in and you're thinking about them more, um, you know, like as you do when you're in the shower, that kind of thing, if something occurs later, um, then just email Aaron and, and Steve and we'll get it worked in. Um, so the nonprofit low income housing tax exemption, um, I think one of the things that we need to uh, get in here um, and the equity benefits is um, echoes what, what Rachel has been saying um, about um, local uh, local support of this, um, providing uh, opportunity for, you know, basically attracting more um, uh, development, um, more affordable development. So that's an equity benefit. It serves your very low income households um, it sir, uh, nonprofits um, may provide culturally specific or other services along with housing. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, I think, a, a polite way of saying that it's serving um, people of color um, uh, at least as often as, uh, as other uh, community members. Um, multifamily housing serves more households um, at a cost that's less per unit. So that's sort of a, a broad kind of... Uh, conclusion as well. Um, and the tax exemptions, they they forego revenue for the city from the city general fund, which could be used for other programs and operations. And that's true for for anything, any money that you're spending. You're choosing to spend it here and not all the other 10 places you can spend it. So for that challenge, uh, if tax exemptions uh, lessen the, the city's revenue general fund, does that um, equate to um, if this goes through that and they don't have the money that they'll go out for another tax or another bond. So we're going to pay for it one way or the other. So, you know, for newly built uh, or for, for nonprofit uh, low income housing um, uh, for every hundred units, approximately the city would be getting less in you know, $90,000 less, um, uh, you know, with that tax exemption. Mm -hmm. um for those those hundred units um so if there was I, I mean if there was a great deal of this um that could certainly make a, a bigger impact on the community and, and you might look at at tax implications um in a, a bigger way susan um mm -hmm. but the um i think of this kind of housing um like platinum um, uh, in other words, it's really hard to come by and it's really, really expensive. Um, and it's a, a little treasure, essentially, um, that your community has. It's so hard to get um, that any ways that the community can reasonably support getting um, some more of it um, has such big equity benefits um, for your people who live in your community and work in your community, mm -hmm. for your seniors, for your people with disability, um, uh, so many of your low income households, um, are working households, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is, is so, so worthwhile and so valuable, um, and, and hard to get. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, uh, I can tell you that at least the aging task force and a whole lot of other people are just thrilled to pieces that CEPA's family he finally here. 
and coming into Twelton. We've been trying for years to convince the city that this was important and that it was necessary. Uh, so uh, when they break ground and start that, but um, uh, there'll be a lot of cheering here for that. And if we could have more, uh, I think it's gonna prove the fact that we need more of that. And I guess my follow on was, it's not like you're going to get a humongous amount of that. Um, in the next uh, the next five years, yeah. the next ten years, I think we're um, lucky. To... Uh, you're lucky to get what you get, basically. Yeah, is, we I are. We're I'm very saying. lucky to have it. And 116 units is is a lot, and and we know that. So um, I'm, I'm very. But um, I just um, uh, the cynic in me says that when the city needs money for something, that um, uh, the SCCs or you know the five dollars on our on our water bill they they tend to just kind of in, um, sneak it in there and I can um, I don't think that trend's going to stop personally. No, Don has unmuted himself. So yeah, I think he to, to kind of answer your your original question, uh, a, a tax exemption any tax exemptions on the property tax side uh, does go you know lessens the amount of general fund money we would have to fund services. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the general fund, our, our, our parks, our library, our police, uh, mm -hmm. we are we do have a low tax rate. Our permanent tax rate is two twenty six sixty five per thousand. It's one of the lowest in the in the areas. Mm -hmm. We do a lot with a little. We can't oh, no. pay that permanent rate. Uh, but so the options, if we needed money to fund services, would be going to a local option levy, which is a limited amount of time. Would have to go to the vote of the people. Uh, for operations every five years and that would you generally it's a, for a specific type of service that you're you're funding uh, and then bonding uh, when you're talking about bonding that's for capital only so again but it would be a public vote but it's for capital uh, so i'm not saying that foregoing tax revenue is a bad thing uh, it, it just has to be weighed against the other services that are provided in the general fund because that's that's where that tax money goes no I, thank you Don, you said it better than I did. Thank you. <laughs> I, I do a lot of property tax uh, pre presentations around the state, so um, it it's probably flows a little bit off my tongue more than than others. I understand. Are there any other comments or questions on this one? Okay, then I'm going to walk us on. So, Mupti. So um, Mupti supports your your moderate income and mixed income housing development. Um, so, and getting that development, development that's affordable um, at less than market rate, um, but above income restricted housing, that's also really hard. Um, uh, your developers, uh, they, they need to build a uh, project that gets them the return on, uh, return on an investment that, that their investors are expecting. Um, uh, and so, you know, this is, you know, where you're asking them to lower rents, um, and then you're giving them something. So there's incentive to, uh, to lower that rent, um, for the, the time frame of the tax exemption. So, uh, it could apply, uh, provide opportunity for a development of affordable housing units in high opportunity areas. Um, and so what we mean by that is, you know, in areas that are particularly near um, various services, areas near transit. It all depends on, on where the city um, applies its, its MUPTI's um, area. Um, but um, I'll just talk about Bridgeport Village and I'm, I'm making stuff up here right now because I don't know that Bridgeport Village would or would not be within where the city would apply MUPTI. Um, but that um, might be an area that that's harder to get um, this this slightly more affordable housing uh, types, and it might be an area where the city really wants to see it. And as I remember it, Steve, this isn't in your urban renewal district. Um, and so I'll just call that a high opportunity area. Yeah, um, it's, it's not in the urban renewal district. And then, you know, depending on what happens at the Southwest border, I think it's a high, I would concur a high opportunity district. And so I think that's a great example. Quick clarifying question. I may have um, I may have missed this. I, I mean, straight off a full day, like most of you, I'm sure. Um, the 
under your challenges, you you note limited time frame. Is that from point of adoption by the city, or is that tied to each individual project? Because for each individual project. Okay. So if a, uh, a project um, uh, is granted MUPTI, um, they ask for MUPTI and uh, they're granted it and it starts in 2024 mm -hmm. um, and the city grants it for 10 years, then it would end in 2034 and presumably rents would go up at that point. Okay. Rachel, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I was going to just say sometimes that's really a big deal. Um, it's less it ha it's less of an increase in a project like this than in some of the ones that have expiring federal subsidies, but it can make yeah. it it's so that a household has to move. Ten years may seem like a long time, or in the case of some of the state funding, thirty or sixty years may, but they're not really because eventually you get to the end of that and you have. Like what just happened right now, Wood Spring Village, which is in Tigard, and about 200 low income seniors just went from affordable housing to market rate housing. And so um, they have a couple of years uh, before they have to, before the change will impact them. But it's a, it's a big, it's a big deal. On the other hand, there's a lot of studies that show that um, the main determinant or a very large determinant of your success um, and your ability to achieve in school is tied to your geography and being able to live in a neighborhood that's higher income um, has a huge impact on kids ability to learn and be successful in school and to and also achieve a higher living wage a higher wage when they are adults and there's like a really famous Harvard study that came out a couple of years ago that showed this um, with a lot of data from around the country. So there's really good reasons to not concentrate people in one place and this is one way to do it. So you pros and cons. I fully agree, pros and cons. That's it all, I'm, I'm gonna have to log off. I've got another meeting I gotta get to. Uh, but I will watch the end of it on the recording. And then uh, if there's any other questions that come up, uh, they let Steve or Aaron know and I can double back with them in the next few days. Thank you, Don. I appreciate your being here. Have a great night. Any other comments or questions on this one? So system development charge um, exemptions. Um, it can... Uh, it can be used to support development of housing that serves low income households. We need to change this um, so that it, you know, it also includes um, the moderate income households. Um, and of course the city can can decide what that threshold is. Um, we'll be suggesting a threshold of up to 80% of median family income. So one of the things to keep in mind is that a lot of these, um, these strategies, they, uh, <laughs> they layer on top of each other. Um, and sometimes I've heard uh, HUD talk about them breeding together. So they interact. Um, so having a MUPTI in and of itself may be insufficient to uh, to support development of the housing that we're talking about, but having um, system development charge exemptions, um, even partial ones may well put it over the uh, uh, put it over the uh, the line, so make it more financially feasible. Um, so SDC exemptions can be uh, can be used um, at a lot of different um, income levels. Um, and uh, you know, they have to be backfilled. So you have to pay for them um, from some other source. Um, and they uh, they again, they forego um, revenue. Not actually sure if it's from the general fund or from uh, I suspect it's actually from uh, your um, uh, 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 capital fund, um, for your, your infrastructure. So we'll change that, um, that could be used to build infrastructure. Um, so we'll sharpen that one up. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, and, and not set on here for challenges, somebody else has to pay this. Um, if you don't have another source of funding, we've got two potential sources of funding, some with SDCs, some with, uh, urban renewal, um, but if you just, you know, you didn't have any of those sources of funding and you granted an exemption um, and it was, say, a $750,000 exemption or half a million dollar exemption, you have to pay for it somehow. 
So you're taking money um, elsewhere. You're, you're, you know, are you raising your your overall rates um, uh, if that was even an option, or are you taking money from the general fund or or some other source? Um, so uh, definitely, um, definitely some challenges there. Any questions or comments on this one? Rachel, what are you seeing uh, uh, happening in other cities um, that you're you're building in um, around SDC um, exemptions? I mean, I feel like it's really there's not you know some places some some parts of the city are willing to provide it. You know, the sometimes the cities SDCs are easier, I think, uh, to get waived. But like for example. Um, Twelve, you know the parks. Twelve has parks and rec. Um, they have really big uh, system development charges. They are amazing and do awesome services. And we were able so, and it, uh, they do care and have passed recently some new rules around that. But it's not like a blanket thing where you can necessarily be guaranteed um, an SDC waiver. And it's pro a project by project experience with them. I think. Um, and unless they did something recently that I don't know. So I think it just depends on the um, particular SDC and the different um, jurisdiction and kind of, of governmental organization that you're working with. Okay. So that was not a very helpful answer probably. It's okay. Any questions or comments on this? If this was easy, they would be done or it wouldn't need to be done. Down payment assistance, the, the, these two, they're they're kind of they're hard for me um because they're so costly the way we've we you know what we've been modeling out here. But home ownership is really an an equity piece. So um, you know, uh it can benefit households that have been uh historically excluded from home ownership. And it allows them to build intergenerational wealth through home um, home equity. Um, uh, but it can't serve, I mean, unless, unless you have, you know, a big pot of money, it can't serve all that many households and be effective. Um, uh, and limited funding creates challenging questions around who receives the assistance. Now, this is another um, example of when you've got um, different programs going on, um, you can get some things done that you couldn't necessarily get done um, otherwise. So, you know, do you have a community land trust who's building in your community? Um, can uh, the city support that um, by granting something like an SDC um, exemption and paying that SDC from another source? Um, and then does the city offer some amount of down payment assistance? Um, I don't know um, how effective $10,000 would be. Um, but, you know, is $25,000, you know, more effective in, in that case um, than in the case of not having a community land trust? And the, the answer is obviously at yes. What I'm trying to say is I'm not sure how how low you can go in homeowner uh, down payment assistance and still have it be effective. Um, but uh, this is a, you know, instance with multiple uh, multiple different things going on where you can accomplish more. Out of interest, uh, talking about how low you can go before it's not effective, can you remind us what the median cost of a home in Tualatin is for a single family home that would be eligible for this sort of assistance? Well, I'm not sure if this would be eligible for this sort of assistance, but the median cost of a single family home uh, a, a year or two ago was around $500,000. So $10,000 so might it's... be better spent in multifamily or something. Yeah, and that's that's exactly some of the trade-off. Um, but if you're looking at a land trust building it, um, uh, then you, I don't think you're talking about a five hundred thousand dollar house. You're probably talking about a much more mod modest house. Right. Or if we see some other changes um, in the state, which I'm I'm expecting us to see, depending on what the legislature does, um, uh, uh, around allowing prefabricated housing. 
Um, so prefabricated housing, I actually don't have in my head, um, Zach, how much new prefabricated housing costs, um, but it's it's substantially less than stick built housing. So housing that's built you know, on the site, especially if you're looking at a more modest house, so a smaller unit. So you might be seeing in, in that case um, a lot more um, uh, effect. So are you looking at a prefab that costs two fifty or three hundred thousand um, dollars once it's you know on the uh, on the site and, and you know fully built and being sold, um, and I'm not sure that that's a, a reasonable price, um, but it becomes more effective. Rachel, I think you had your hand up. Maybe you were just yeah. I was just, yeah, I was just gonna say that um, also this idea of I think you mentioned uh, land trust, which means that the um, the affordability gets some of it gets retained so there is like an increase so there is some wealth building not as much as the whole the whole um so with the land trust uh the a nonprofit continues ownership of the land um so when the house is sold whoever is selling that house gets the it, it increase based on the value of the house but they don't get an increase based on the value of the land and that helps to maintain affordability over time and there's some other, there's about other rules as well around there um, so that's like a kind of a compromise position You're, and you can build, um, you know, sometimes you can build not, it's not like multifamily, but you could do clustered housing where maybe you have four attached units. So you're getting a little bit more bang for your buck. So there's uh, some ways to get there that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, big house with a fence around it kind of thing. Exactly. Um, do you know if any land trusts are doing cottage housing or prefab housing? I don't know. I mean, I think the thing with prefab right now is, um, or what is that this? I mean, when you say prefab, are you thinking modular? Like, yeah. Um, so I just, it's uh, right now, the savings is not in the cost of the construction, but in the time that it takes to build the housing. And there's a huge backlog. So we haven't scaled it up yet as a community. I think that there could be amazing savings if we could scale it up. Um, and do it more quick, you know, do it like I would love to do a house like that, but like there's like a huge wait list. So to get prefab stuff. There's other barriers to prefab um, in the state, which hopefully um, some of those barriers will be overcome by some new legislation. So. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes. Um, and I, you might have said this before, uh, hypothetically, if someone, if we had um, down payment assistance, and you qualify for it and you get X number of dollars to help you uh, buy a home, do you have to pay that back? Um, Mary, go ahead, Rachel. Mary also probably has something. I'm happy to cede the floor to Mary. I don't know that I know the answer to that. Um, Sometimes I think it has to do with length of time too. So uh, like if you, there's some places where like, if you get a subsidy or there's some models where like, if you get a subsidy and your family all is there for 30 years or 35 years, that whole, you don't have to pay anything back. Like it's just becomes part of your family, pass it on. You know, I think that's like the habitat model. And then I think with the other ones, there's, there's like a, it has after a period of time, if it's a smaller amount, like the because habitat's like basically the whole house, but it has to do sometimes with time, how long it's been, if that makes sense. And some programs have like a certain threshold that your income can increase up to without triggering anything. Like if you were at X percent of AMI when you started using the program and it grows up to like double what it was before, it won't trigger any changes. So I think some of this ends up being in how the city sets up its program. Um, uh, and some of it ends up being in uh, if the city is, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, partnering with another agency, um, what the other agency um, uh, allows. And when I say agency, I mean a community land trust or something like that. So. So then I'm going to take us on to rehabilitation programs um, and they benefit your low income households um, and ensure longer stability 
um, uh, can provide resources to disabled residents and seniors that need to make accessibility improvements. Um, uh, I, I, gosh, those two are, rehab really hits me a little in the, the, the hearts. Um, uh, because it's, it's helping people granted they already own their house, but it's helping people stay in their home as well. Um, uh, which down payment assistance should hit me in the same place. Um, uh, it has a higher cost per household. Um, so you can, you know, serve fewer people and, uh, again, limiting funding, um, create challenging questions. What I've, what I've seen some communities do is, you know, you, you might split the difference um, among some of these programs. So um, if there's other organizations that um, are uh, have rehabilitation programs, like weatherization programs, that kind of thing, um, one, can the city um, apply for grants that, that push funding to those organizations? And I don't quite know the answer to the Healthy Homes, um, the new OHA um, program, because I think the rules are still being written for that program. But that might be something that the city can do there. And the city might focus its efforts where nobody's doing enough um, or nobody's doing much. Like I know that City of Eugene offers um, grants for accessibility improvements, um, whereas there's other nonprofits or in the area that are that are offering um, rehabilitation programs. Clackamas County um, runs its own rehabilitation program. I can't remember if Washington County um, has one or not. So it might be something that the city decides to dedicate some funding to uh to you know support another program where that that funding would come back to people living in Tualatin. And the city might establish its own program if there's a hole. So in other words, if there's um nobody doing accessibility improvements, that kind of thing. Um so there's a, a number of different ways to approach uh approach, I think, both of these, um, rehabilitation and um, down payment assistance, where it's not all or nothing. And remember that about 15% of your CET is going to um, Oregon Housing and Community Services and is supposed to come back in the form of down payment assistance from the state. I have to take so that's off kind of... Minute. Oh, perfect. Well, I, I've got a few more slides, um, but that's kind of that. That's where we end up with this these equity discussions. Um, so, what we're going to come back to you with, um, and Rachel, I can see that you have to take off. Um, so, what we'll come back to you with is, um, you know, some updates to this, the whole uh, draft document, um, which you've seen large parts of at this point, um, and then more discussions of what we might recommend um, to the council. Um, and then hopefully you'll have some input into that. And then separate from those recommendations, we'll be looking to you for, do you have a, a, a suggestion to council for what they should be doing um, with this plan um, and with implementing the HPS? So um, I'm gonna continue on, um, but I'll let Rachel go. Cause I think you said you needed to. I actually also am gonna need to duck out. I have another meeting waiting on me. <laughs> Sorry. Wow, I thought I, I was we going to come so close. Okay, well, I thought we were going till seven. The appointment was till yeah. seven, wasn't it? That's what I had it down okay. for. I apologize. Well, then we can, can end right here. For five more um, minutes. I can stick around for five more, more minutes, Beth. I just, if you just, if that's fine. Zach, if you need to duck out, duck out. We'll okay. send you the slides. I'm going to let you go. Thank you, guys. Okay. So I'll just take another minute or two. Um, I apologize, I, I thought we were going to 7.30. So, you know, recommendations for building equity into implementation of the HPS, this is bigger. Um, so looking at the membership of an oversight committee that would be implementing the HPS, um, reaching out to your, your um, BIPOC community and your community of people who are disproportionately cost burdened. Look for more partnerships with nonprofits who serve specific types of uh, of housing, so cultural specific outreach. We said some things earlier that I, I don't have in my head right now, but that I bet Mary has written down that will get onto this list. And I'm gonna go on to the next slide, but if you have other thoughts, um, uh, you might uh, wanna send them over to Steve you, or Aaron. I think you wanna compensate 
compensate folks for their time, especially if they're low income. That's a good point. Um, so we've got some questions for decision makers, um, uh, and and I don't think we'll we'll quite phrase them as as this right here because reading these on the screen um, makes it feel like an either or. Um, but you know, prioritize serving more renter households um, or providing more home ownership support. I think we'll we'll say that a little bit differently um, because I feel like we're pitting two groups against each other, which is not the intention. Um, uh, but you know, weigh the, the 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 relative cost and benefits um, of uh, of each. Um, and uh, looking at would the city fund the remaining gaps between cost and and uh, need for down payment assistance or homeowner uh, rehabilitation? How would the city doing that, that do that? And that goes to the additional sources of funding that we're talking about. Um, I think it's the city willing to forego local tax exemptions, um, uh, especially for MUPTI. Um, uh, and how much urban renewal um, revenue is the city will, willing to dedicate towards housing projects? And I think that's a, a question that will have to be answered as the city implements its urban renewal plan. Um, and then our question for you more broadly is, uh, you know what have we what have we not thought about that you think we should be talking about? And I am going to stop there because we've lost Rachel also. Just me. <laughs> well, Susan, we're glad to have you here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um. So yeah, Steve, have well, I missed anything? Eric, have I missed anything? I'm sorry, you asked me? I was asking Steve and Aaron. Oh, Steve, I'm sorry. No, I think this has been great, thank you. Sure. I agree, great presentation. This is well, really we'll interesting. Be... Um, I'm I'm going on uh, on March 8th, the, the um, Bend Chamber of Commerce is having a uh, workforce housing equity uh, s uh, seminar or a meeting that I'm gonna oh, take. Oh, um, Talking and uh, the, um, overview I got today is very similar to what we're talking about, about equity and, and housing. So I'm going to sit in on that. Uh, fortunately, it's Zoom also. But um, we're getting more and more questions, I know, at the Chamber uh, through business about this issue and certainly with our um, residential and older populations. So I really appreciate being a part of this and I'm learning um, uh, a lot to look, a lot of things to look at. And it's a slow process. Well, it's too slow for some yeah. and fast, too fast for others, I'm sure. Well, if Bind is uh, uh, saying anything that, that's particularly new and interesting to you, um, you can always tell us because, you know, in, in planning, we steal from each other. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's why I, I was glad our meeting is tonight and then I, uh, it's a couple of weeks, but I can, I, uh, and I take lots of notes and I have all the, all the, the information you all send us um, that I print out and get through those all those 37 pages at some point. But um, I would imagine it's pretty similar. I think everybody's going through much of the same thing. Bind has been really smart um, uh, over a lot of years around affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, and they've built up a really good program there. I'm actually doing a fair bit of work for City of Bend around housing right now. So well, maybe I'll learn something, some more, something more. Well. Um, well, we're in front of the city council on uh, March 13th, talking to them about this, giving uh, a presentation that I imagine will be a little different than this, um, mm -hmm. but hitting on a lot of the same points. Um, when is our next meeting? Did you say it was March 5th? No, our next meeting um, is, uh, let me see, uh, it is March 22nd. Oh, March 22nd. Okay, so... What are you, you're presenting on, on March 13th to the council? Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, on this on this committee. Okay. On this should topic. We be, on this topic. So we should be there. Erin, uh, do we need to be there or to, just to listen? You're welcome um, to, to come and listen. We don't need you just yet for the. Oh, I'm not talking. I, would, I wouldn't be uh, doing uh, making any comments. I just didn't know if you needed the committee in, in, you know, in the room or. No, but we'd be happy to have you there if you want to come. Okay, I'll put more. Okay, March 13th. So and, it's a work session. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Susan, what I would say would be very helpful if you wanted to, and it doesn't have to be for this meeting, it could be for the next city council meeting, um, is if you have uh, observations about uh, what we've been talking about and what seems to be important to you. Um, uh, and, and, you know, your perspective, um, I think as a committee member and as a member of the chamber and, you know, task force or seniors and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, um, it's a valuable one. Oh, so thank you. I think, um, well, I'll, I think I'll have, I'll have, have, a, I'll have a, I'll have a, I'll have an aging task force meeting before, uh, the council meeting. So, I, uh, we can talk about it then and I get their input and, um, mm -hmm. I can always get the uh, chamber input. We'll have a board meeting before that also so that I can um, get some perspective from them. And, and I filter this information out as best I can to the people that need to hear it besides me. Um, Good, thank so, you. But thank you, um, uh, I can do that. Well, well, champions you are the hardest to get in a community. I'm sorry? I didn't, champions I didn't. are the hardest to build in a community. Um, oh. and, and you're definitely, you know, you're a champion here. Thank you very much. I um, um, I do it because, um, well, somebody has to, and I have a, I have a really loud voice, and um, uh, sometimes I, uh, but um, just a couple of things that are, you know, when you get, when it's near and dear to your heart, because uh, I'm very fortunate, I will tell you, I have a, I'm a old senior now or, or older adult, but um, I've been very fortunate in my life. Uh, but I know so many people that aren't that are close to me, and if they can't speak up, then it's my it's then I have to. So, because um, I know how lucky I am, so I um, as long as I can do this, I'll do it. But it really is an opportunity to work with all of you. I've uh, I've learned an incredible amount, uh, and thank you all for doing this because your time is very thank valuable, you. and it's nighttime now, and you know, so. I will stop speaking and you all can go home and I'll see you in March. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Yep.